came to me last week when I was sharing the message and I said that Noah had been divinely warned of things that had never been seen before, that never happened before. And I was thinking about this tremendous privilege that you and I, we have being Christian, that we can be divinely warned, we can be divinely helped, we can have this type of connection, this intimate connection with, with the Lord to, to, to be constantly under His care and in tune with Him and all this. And I have the feeling that in many modern churches or for modern Christians are so busy that we tend to rely a lot more on our intellect than on, on our spiritual connections with the Lord. I want to go to slide number two and uh, talk a little bit about this. This, we, many of you are very familiar with, with this, but I like this, this diagram because it's so helpful to explain something about our spiritual life. Uh, God created each one of us body, soul, and spirit. We, we, we know what the body is, our five uh, senses and our tools. And the soul, if you want to click, you will see the soul. Here I put many things, but we could add to that. Uh, the reason, the will, the emotions, the affections, the impulses, the imaginations, and the memory. This is a lot of things going on in, our, this, in this mind, in this personality, in this inner man. Uh, all this. So if you click the second one. Yeah, but Paul talks in the Bible, and especially in Corinthians, about uh, two types of men. Uh, the sukikos, su or the, the psyche, the psychological man, which means the man who dominates his life with his intellect, and it means without the Spirit of God. And if you see here the Spirit, I put uh, two, two, two choices here, two options. One is dead, and one is alive. Ephesians chapter 2 says very clearly that we were dead uh, in our sins and in our trespasses. So our spirit is disconnected from the life of God when we are in sin. There's a wall, there's a separation. It says in Ephesians again, uh, I think in chapter 5, that we are separated from the life of God. So the spirit of God, the life of God, if we are in our sin, is, means that our, the spirit of man is dead. So if that's the case, that means that we are completely controlled, walking, dominated, inclined to follow only these here. They are, they are governing our lives, making our choices, the options, <coughs> the things we like. And as a result, then the man without the spirit, the Bible calls it, when we live based on the needs and the impulses of the body and our, and our soul, we will be carnal, the flesh and our sinful nature, self, pride, greed, and lust will be the mark of our lives. That's, that's what happened because there is no, uh, the goodness of God, the attributes of God, the, the work of God is not yet in operation in our lives. So we are dominated by the uh, human nature. So if our spirit gets to be born again, now we can click on the next one, we are the pneumaticos, we have the breath of God in our lives, spirit, so now we can live by the spirit, and the difference and, and the mark of our lives will be in the next one, forgiveness, and out of it, the sense of freedom, faith, love, hope, uh, prayer, worship, reverence, obedience, spiritual insight, discernment, and the list can go on. So as you can see, there's a big difference between these two lifestyles. But the way that Paul talks about it, he puts the two groups in the church and Corinth. That means that Christians may very well uh, allow the sinful nature or the flesh to take predominance over the working of the Holy Spirit. So that's what I want to call your attention to today. So if in our modern Christians or Western Christianity and our modern life, then we as Christians deprive ourselves of the right and the privilege of having this connection, this deep connections, this constant connection, this continual working of the Holy Spirit in our life, 
then we deprive ourselves from a lot of our privilege. This is what we are called to live by the Spirit, walk by the Spirit, and you will not accomplish the desire of the flesh. So anyway, I wanted to, to start with this one to help ourselves to, to distinguish which side of our life is more, uh, we, we identify more with, with, this, with this graph. Which side are we identifying? Are we more in tune with the Spirit? Do we depend? Do we rely upon? Are we, are, are we daily in communication with the Lord? Or do we, uh, you know, in our conversations, in our planning, in our vacations, in our choice of career, in our relationship with people, like uh, the, the daily, you know, life that we do and all the choices of that daily life, do we rely on our intellect? always the reasoning or emotionals we don't like this so we will choose that you know and and let the self dominate so anyway i want this morning to encourage all of us to it's a simple message to rekindle the fire of the holy spirit the passion the desire uh, it says in roman that uh, those who are uh, um, inclined towards or attached to, they want to follow the Spirit, they will receive life and glory. If you attach yourself to the flesh, the desire, the human needs, then you will find death and this and this choice. So th there's a big, big difference. I want to urge us this morning, before we go uh, to the text we will look at, to rekindle the fire. Paul says to Timothy, this is why I remind you to fan into flames the spiritual gift God gave you. He says also, do not neglect the spiritual gift you receive. So there's a fan into flame and do not neglect. So which is a possibility we can choose not to fan to flame and just go on with our intellectual. God has given us a, a, a intelligence and the word of God is sanctifying our intelligence. That's already a good thing. We can do a lot of very positive and good things. We are all good people here, I believe, in this room. So God is already working in our intellect and in our emotions. We have been sanctified in many, many ways. But is, is that all what we, what we are searching for or seeking for? Or we want the full package the privilege that God is offering to us. I was thinking and Noah was divinely warned, like uh, he, he was saved and it led to the salvation of his family. So anyway, having said this, uh, I, I'm reading through the Bible, as many of you are, and I am now in the wonderful uh, place of uh, first king, second king, and uh, you know all these things, which is a very dark uh, sections of the Bible. Lots of killing, lots of bloods, and lots of, you know, it's it's amazing that all the kings of Israel, after the divisions of the two kingdoms, all the kings of Israel are evil in the sight of the Lord. Every one of them, the leader people to more sins. The son of this one does sins worse than the father before, and God is angry and he leads the people away from the, the Lord and to idolatry. From the king of Judah, there are a few good ones among most of them are not good, but some of them have been good. So reading through, through this very dark time of history, I can still find some hope. It's like sometimes you have a, this really rainy day like we had this week. I think, I, mean, I think it's a good example because it's fresh to us. It's suddenly dark, it's raining, it's pouring down, and then suddenly there's a ray of sunshine just piercing through a cloud. Is that right? So the book of, uh, this, this sections of the Bible is like that. It's really dark with dark clouds, but every now and then you have a ray of sunshine piercing through. And that, that's what I want to, to, to uh, uh, take your attention upon. When you read First and Second King, you will be surprised to read how many times the word prophet is mentioned. And that, that's the directions I'm going uh, this morning. Really, really. We know a lot of the major prophets. Uh, Isaiah, Jeremiah, Ezekiel, Daniel, we know them. We know many of the minor prophets because these are people who have uh, preached, they have written, uh, so we have texts to read about uh, 
the confrontation, the, the social impact that they have, Amos, Habakkuk, uh, Micah, uh, Malachi, and, and so many others that we have, Haggai, and so, but we have many other prophets that are unnamed or that we do not know a lot about. They are not either in the major or the minor prophets, but they are still prophets. And they are in this dark time of history, and they are active, and they are being sent by God, and they are being the voice of God in the dark time. And that brings so much encouragement to me, because I don't know if you agree with me, but I believe that we live in very dark morally, socially, uh, politically, time and, the, and history. It, it, this, this is like a, not a good time if we look at what, what we read in the news, what we see on TV. But if God has been so active in one of the worst time in the history of the world, don't you think that he continues to be like this? And this is what we've been saying this morning, who was and is and is to come. This is the, the, the continuation of the, the prayer that Pastor Jennifer prayed. I'm amazed sometimes when we prepare a sermon, how many prayers and songs connect uh, all together to, to support what uh, God, uh, the Holy Spirit, wants to, to, to say to all of us. What does it tell us? Well, first of all, that God is present. He's always been present and always willing to intervene and speak to whoever wants to go to him, search him. And those years, they used to go to the prophets, the seers, and inquire what is God's will. And all sorts of people went to the, to the prophets. Did you know that from 1 Samuel to 2 Chronicles, you have more than 65 mentions of prophets? And only in First and Second Chronicle you have more than 45 mentions of prophets. That's a lot. And this just a few chapters. These are not really big books. That the prophet has such a, a, a predominant role and, and importance in, in that. So are you ready yes. to plunge into? So we want to go into this dark time and see what God is and draw some uh, encouragement for us because living in a dark generation like they do, you need also an encouragement. Okay, let's go to slide number three, First King chapter 13. And also know that there are some pretty, uh, allow me to use the word weird. I don't want to do it like uh, impolitely. But it's, it's weird to our uh, modern thinking, uh, to some of the stories that uh, uh, we read in these sections of the book. Okay, the, 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 at the Lord's command, okay, you know what happened in this story. The kingdom has been separated. Jeroboam is now king of the northern tribes, Israel, and the capital is Samaria. And in fear of losing the allegiance of his people to go and worship to, uh, to Jerusalem, he started a, a worship system of his own with an uh, altar and he appointed priests. And, and he caused the people of God to walk away from God and idolatry. And God is really angry. God is really angry. So at the Lord's command, here is a man of God or a prophet from Judah, no name. We don't know who he is. He went to Bethel. He was commanded by the Lord to go. And he arrived there as Jeroboam himself. Appoint himself as priest. He is offering the sacrifice himself. Then at the Lord's command, he shouted, O oh, altar, altar, this is what the Lord says. A child named Josiah will be born into the dynasty of David. On you he will sacrifice the priests from the pag pagan shrines who come here to burn incense, and human bones will be burned on you. And the prophet went on to say, This altar will fall apart, and the ashes on it will be scattered. Then you will know that the Lord has spoken through me. So how do you know when the prophet speaks? He said, a sign will happen. The king was really angry, and he stretched his hand, and he ordered, Seize that man. At once the king's arm became paralyzed so that he could not. So already a judgment came on him. His, his arm is paralyzed. He cannot pull it pull it back and at this time the altar suddenly fell apart and the ashes spilled to the ground as the prophet has predicted in the name of the Lord the King Jeroboam said to the prophet please pray for me to the Lord your God and ask him to heal my arm the prophet prayed 
to the Lord and the king's arm was healed. So you would think that now King Jeroboam will repent, will return to the Lord, says, I've learned my lesson. No, not at all. It became worse. It became worse. And the, the remaining part of the chapter, we will read that he, he still did not turn from his evil ways and continued to choose priests from ordinary families. And the sin on his part brought about the ruin of to and total destructions of his dynasty. Other prophet came and prophesied that all of his descendants will die. There will not be a succession of descendants. They will all die. He will die. Everybody else will die. Now a little strange uh, story in, in between uh, here. At that time, there was an old prophet living in Bethel. So this is not on the slide here, but I will just tell you what it happened. This first prophet from Jerusalem now is uh, from Judah is returning and had been ordered by God do not eat do not go to any home and do not return by the same way you came so he's obeying and he's going then this is kind of weird it's hard to be to, to understand that an old prophet living in battle is a liar he's a prophet but he's a lying prophet so I don't know how it works together but he runs after him and he invited him to go to his home. And the prophet, of course, says, No, the Lord commanded me, don't go, don't stop, don't eat, just go. But he, he said, this prophet from Bethel says, I too am a prophet, just like you. And the Lord's command, an angel told me to take you home with me. Oh, that changes a lot of things. So the Lord spoke another message. So he decided to go home with him and trusted this prophet but God had told him. So anyway, to make a short story, the, the prophet from Bethel says, you disobeyed the word of the Lord. The Lord told you not to come home and not to stop on the way. You disobeyed, you will die. So as this prophet leaves this other prophet's home, he meets with the lion, the lion kill him, and he stayed by the side of the road. Then the prophet from Bethel goes to take the body of this prophet brings him and bury him and battle okay that's you see what wh why are you telling us this kind of <laughs> crazy story yeah because there's a point to it that you will meet a little bit later okay so a prophet lied to another prophet what can we learn about this don't trust everything that looks spiritual okay that's the one of the first rule if god wants to speak to you you have the Holy Spirit in you. He will first speak to you. And if you need confirmation, because there's an important decision, he will probably send to you other voice or other signs or other confirmation, but no contradictions. And if someone comes to you, I had a dream about you, and the Lord gave me a word for you, go and marry this one, please don't do it. <laughs> Just uh, continue to pray for a while, just uh, in case it doesn't, doesn't work. Okay. The Bible says, do not believe every spirit. So there's a lot of lessons we can learn. And then lesson of discernment. Listen to the Lord's instructions. And it's very possible. You know, sometimes we are so proud of our spiritual achievement. I can be used by God, and God can guide me to do something. And I'm so proud because I have obeyed the Lord perfectly. And next time, maybe I will disobey the Lord. I will compromise with another things. So it's a little bit what we have, the, pos the potentials of disobedience, the potential of losing our way, the potential of compromising. The Lord guides us, but then we may choose to listen to another voice. Because, uh, I go back to the three circles, because our impulses, because of ourself, because it's, it seems in our mind and our intellect that it will bring more benefit to us. Balaam is one of these prophets that, that he, uh, he, he, he served that purpose also is an example in the Bible. So let us be true to God when God wants to use us. Let's be careful. Also, if we look at the king under the side of the king uh, Jeroboam, uh, even though the Lord answered his prayer, you remember he was paralyzed, he was healed, he did not repent, and he did not return to the Lord. So not everybody that the Lord bless is going to repent and come back to the Lord. Now I want to go 
uh, further in time, quite a long time in the future. This is a very uh, good illustration here. Second King 13, slide 4. King Josiah, do you remember the prophecy of this uh, man of God from Judah? Okay. This pr prophecy said that uh, a son named Josiah will be born to the house of David and that he would destroy the altar of Bethel. So this is what we are reading now. Do you, know, do you realize this is the fulfillment of a prophecy given 300 years before? See, wow. Wow, yeah, yeah, that's good, that's good. King Josiah smashed the sacred pillars and cut down the Asherah poles. Then he desecrated these places by scattering human bones over them. The king also tore down the altar of Bethel, the pagan shrine that Jeroboam son of Nebat had made when he caused Israel to sin. He burned down the shrine and to ground it to dust. Then just Josiah turned around and noticed several tombs and the side of the hill. He ordered that the bones be brought out and he burned them on the altar at Bethel to desecrate it. This happened just as the Lord had promised through the man of God when Jeroboam stood beside the altar at the festival. Then Josiah turned and looked at the tomb of the man of God. Ah, you see, there's a point to my story. To the man of God who had predicted these things. Now put yourself in the mind of this young king, Joshua, uh, Josiah, that is now looking at the tomb. He's told that. It's, he inquired what, 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 because he's destroying tombs and bones and he's burning and desecrating the altar. Then he comes to the tomb of these two prophets. Because the prophet from Bethel, in this story, there's a little bit part more. The prophet from Bethel told his son, when I will die, bury me next to the prophet from Judah. So these two prophets, the one from Judah and Bethel, are buried together. And then 300 years later, King Jos Josiah came to this place, then inquiring whose, whose graves are those. This is the grave of the prophet that prophesied 300 years ago that you will be the one desecrating these altars. Imagine the shock, the realization of King Josiah to realize that I, I had been prophesied upon. I had been preordained in my life to accomplish this role. This, to, to me, this is blow, blow my mind away. I, I, please take a, mo a moment to, to, to allow God to blow your mind away as well, okay? <laughs> Let's, let's all blow away, okay? Blow, blow, blow. Okay, anyway, sorry. <laughs> Fulfillment of a prophecy 300 years. Josiah is one of the few men in scriptures named before his birth. There's not many of them named before they were born. He was a chosen vessel foreordained to fulfill the prophecy of an unnamed prophet against the altar. I've been thinking about this story and I'm, as I said, I feel in awe. And I look at how deep the knowledge in the sovereignty of God is. And it speaks to me. It speaks to, to me as, a, as an individual, person living in the dark world, in the dark generation. But it speaks to me also as a father, as a grandfather, in having descendants who follow after me. What God can do when a young person and his generation will commit to him. Think about that. If you are a student here in this room today, at university, or thinking of a career, or you have children that are at school today, think about this reality of the sovereignty of God, and God as the as plans and he foreordain and he knows in advance what he can do, the potential that he can do in the life of someone if that person walk with him in intimacy, if that person commits and let God lead him and work his purpose in his life. Think about that, what God can do. I'm thinking of the children of the summer English camp. I was thinking, I was reading about this story, I'm thinking about that. What is going to happen in these children 
This is the eighth year, Pastor Gen Jennifer and Priscilla, the vision. The ninth year, oh, okay. <laughs> That's a lot of years of telling the stories. Many of them have received the Lord. Without this camp, they would not have heard. They come from this little forsaken village over there. It's like today you look at the, the earthquake, uh, the, the, the flood that, that destroyed this village, and you look, you look at this place and you see, I have no connection with that. This is the forsaken land. It's at the end of the world. But at the end of the world, there are people who are living. And these children would not have a chance to be part of God's big plan for the future generation. Do you know if some of these children will not become uh, politically involved, morally involved, socially involved to bring reform in that country at one time? If they are not going to, because of the, the learning English, going to go abroad someday and, uh, you know, become a doctor or become, you know, like a professional, come back to China with the visions and the calling of God in their life. You know, we, we don't know these things, but we must think about these things. Your children, do, do you know what God wants to do with your children? This is an awesome thing. Hallelujah. When I was uh, more active in China, in my early years of doing mission work in China, I don't know how many cre Christians I met. When I was asking them, how did you become a Christian? My grandmother was a Christian. My grandmother, before the Cultural Revolution, would bring me to, to, to church. This is awesome. God is working through generation. The sovereignty of God is at work. Before the conception, way before the conception of Josiah, way before his birth, God prophesied 300 years before what he would be doing. That, that, that blows my mind. No, I'm not exaggerating. It is amaz amazing. And also what it does, it gives me hope for your children and for my grandchildren. Sometimes, I, I tell you honestly, I, I look at this generation, the children, the way they are brought up and the, the, the context of this moral culture, and I, I, it's very dark. I don't see a lot of uh, hope, and I feel sad for these young children growing and this immorality and this. And I think about my grandchildren, and I, I, I cannot really find hope. But when I was reading this, I says, hey, wait a minute, there is a God. There is a God, don't forget him. He is sovereign over generation. And you don't know what he can do. He can raise up one of these unborn child uh, in the next generation and switch the government around, bring a revival in the land. We don't know when the Lord would come back. I, I don't, I'm not prophesying anything. I'm just saying God can do. There is hope for my grandchildren. There is hope for your children and their generation, no matter how dark it is. Are you encouraged by that this morning? Yes. There is so much hope. There is so much hope. And it gives me an assurance for the future, for the future of my life and for the future in general, if I walk dedicated to God. I'm safe. I, I'm, I'm on the good side. God, God is working. I'm, I'm very excited about this, uh, this story and what it has produced in, in my heart. That's why I want to ch uh, share it with you. I, I'm really encouraged by that. Amen? Amen? Hallelujah. Let's go to the next slide, slide number five. There's another prophet here and the wife of Jeroboam. Now we're going back to the same king we were talking about, this ungodly king. And then his son is sick, and he sent his wife to disguise herself and pretend she's not his wife, and go to Shiloh, a holy place, find the prophet Ahijah, and this is the prophet that actually prophesied on King Jeroboam before he was king that he would become king. So he says, go there, pretend you don't know me, pretend you're somebody else, you will not know, you know, and then inquire about, you know, this is a family crisis. This is a family crisis of an ungodly person. You know, uh, rich and poor have crises. Uh, if, even if you live in a palace or if you live in a, a, in a slum area, if you have a family, you, you will run into crisis because this is the portion of our human fallen 
conditions. That's what happened in the life of people. So here they are going to their family crisis. And now, to make it more awesome, this prophet is old now, and he is blind. So not only, even if she disguises herself or not, he is blind, he cannot see her. But there is a God. Did you know that there is a God? And this God told the prophet, she will come here pretending to be someone else. She will ask about her son. He is very sick. Give her the answer I give you. So when Ahijah heard her footsteps at the door, he called out, Come in, wife of Jeroboam. <laughs> Surprise. Why are you pretending to be someone else? Then he told her, I have bad news for you. Unbearable news. Your son will die as soon as you will walk back to town and tell your husband that all of his descendants will all die. You will not have a single uh, living descendant in your life. And he would die in an horrible death as well. So what do we learn in something? God is not being fooled. God knows everything. God knows everybody. Um, God sees true and true. And the Lord is merciful and he even used ungodly people. To, because I believe that God is so merciful that he will always give a chance. If, if an ungodly person wants to consult the Lord, you will let him consult. But at the same time, you will tell him the truth. And sometimes it's not what people want. You know, when, when we ask the Lord, most of the time we say, Lord, we tell the Lord what we want, we, what the, the, the answer should be. We tell him before, Lord, I want this. Lord, bless this. I have this plan, Lord, bless it. Lord, will you open the door for me? Blah, 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 kind of something. But let us be ready to uh, receive the answer that the Lord is given. In this case, this is a negative, dramatic thing. But in our, in our life, it can be uh, either positive, negative, or wait, or change, change plan, or withhold for a while. Amen? Amen. Hallelujah. So there's a lot of things that we can learn from these, these lessons. But my favorite one, we're coming to that one, and it's because uh, we see the, the, the big picture. You see God's sovereignty over 300 years, and now you will see a, a very uh, personal encounter, a very caring uh, story, Elijah and the widow of Z Zarephath. Hallelujah. You know that story. I think it's a very popular uh, story in the Bible. There's a famine in the land, and Elijah is the prophet. And Elijah uh, received the word from God, go to Zarephath, to a widow. And I've noticed this part just this morning on my way to church. I commanded her. I already commanded her to provide for you. I'd never really uh, stop on, on that one. I don't know how God communicated to that widow uh, on what forms and how clear the picture was, but God told uh, Elijah, go there, I already commanded her to provide for you. So anyway, that's what happened. There's a famine, and then he says, please bring me water. She goes to enter her home, says, oh, but before, don't forget, uh, bring me a bread also. Oh, but I have only a handful of flour left, a little bit of oil, and I was going to cook it for my son and I, and then we are going to die. And then Elijah said to her, don't be afraid. And how we love that sentence, and, dra and, and our drama, and our crisis, and our helplessness, when you feel out of resources, you don't know where to turn, your, your, your intellect is not enough anymore to bring the solutions. Don't be afraid. When the Lord speaks, don't be afraid deep down into your heart. How comforting. Sometimes this is the only word you need to know. You don't even need to know there's a solution. You just need to hear that first. Don't be afraid. Stop worrying. Just rely on me. Just find your peace in me. Do just what you've said, but make a little bread for me first. Then use what's left to prepare a meal for yourself and your son. For this is what the Lord, the God of Israel, says. Oh, so here, the Lord, the God of Israel, is speaking. There will always be flour and olive oil left in your containers until the time when the Lord sends rain and the crops grow again. For three, there's an element of time here for three and a half years. 
this little handful of flour and oil will continue to feed them these three that's that's awesome this the widow accepted uh, responded to the command of God showed faith she submitted to the man of God she exercised a measure of faith that she had and God granted her a miracle I was also thinking of the fact that when Jesus began his ministry in Luke chapter 4 when he was at the synagogue in, in Nazareth and he declared that he was he was today fulfilling the, the prophecy of Isaiah chapter 61 later on he continued to talk says a prophet is not welcome in his own land and then he says there was many many poor people there are many widows uh, in Israel at the time of the famine but God commanded Elijah to go to Zarephath and to go there and people got very angry but you know what it gives me a lot of hope when we went to uh, uh, Payatas at the slum there the medical mission uh, sister uh, Evelyn wrote us a note or the son of sister Evelyn there is no forsaken place for God okay, imagine there's a famine and and there's a lot of little forsaken village we for us that would be forsaken far away place little place uh, uh, things that place that we don't know about we've never been there but not to God, not to God. God knew about Zarephath. He knew about this family. He knew the plans that he was going to, to make for that family. It gives a lot of hope for the mission and this world. It gives a lot of hope to the church to continue and their uh, commitment and their engagements and the Lord's work. There is no forsaken place anywhere in the Lord God has not for, uh, forsaken anywhere God has not stopped working God is not resting God is not sleeping sometimes we are but God is not and until we can walk with the Holy Spirit there will always be a target there will always be a challenge there will always be a mountain to climb an ocean to cross a village to reach always with God because that's who God is that's who God is what a wonderful story that we have here an impossible situation no work financial crisis a famine no resources no people able to help but there's a story of hope nevertheless and the hopeless I don't think we can describe any worse condition than that story and still it ends up being a story of hope. That's how awesome God is. And please say amen to that. Yeah. Because God is so awesome to turn a, a hopeless situation into a story of hope. Only God can do that. Only God can do that. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Nothing is impossible to, to God. Hallelujah. Amen. And then for all the time, three and a half years, they continued to eat in all of this. And there was always flour and olive oil in these containers as the Lord promise awesome the word of the Lord but second point there is a worse crisis happening in the life of this person and the eyes of God in our eyes this is settled the miracle is done the story is finished it's beautiful no it is not because God is so much deeper than we are my thought is so much higher than yours for us the the widow's care is taken care of no it's not she is not saved she has not justification and I will prove it to you just by the remaining part of the text verse continue verse 17 sometime later <laughs> the woman's son became sick he grew worse and worse and finally he died then she said to Elijah oh listen to what she says and uh, think like she does oh man of God what have you done what have you done to me? The son dies. What have you done to me? Have you come here to point out my sins? And then Elijah cried to God, healed the, 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 the son, and goes. I want to, to talk a bit about this because it's very, very important that we understand that. Life is not easy for most people in this world. Um, and in our lives, 
we will encounter more than one crisis, most likely. We, we don't like to hear about it, but you, you go through a crisis, then God will intervene, either a healing, a blessing, or an act, a divine act of mercy, and then you feel so, wow, so special, your, your, your problem is taken care of. And you continue next week, or next month, or next year, another crisis may, may just end up, and may be worse, and may be of the same kind. We don't know. So there's more than one crisis. Here she, she has a famine, and then she loses her son. And, and the famine is not the problem for the son's death. It's not the cause, because they had food to eat. They were provided. So there's another crisis, completely a family crisis. In a time of, of a crisis like this, you know, uh, people will look for someone to blame. And many times, blaming God. Why God have you allowed this? Why God has you allowed this? Or blame the husband. Or blame the wife. Usually the blaming game is very important in the family crisis. Uh, it's your fault, it's your fault, or something like this. Uh, but anyway, uh, that's not the point. Most of us, we are interested in our own prosperity. And uh, uh, we don't have deep concerns into, the, into God. Man of God, what have you done to me? God had a plan for this woman to bring her to justification, to believe in Him in a deeper way, and, and I believe to, to bring a salvation experience and into her life. So number one, she blamed the man of God. She blames God. She blames. She has to find someone. Number two, in family crisis, my pastoral experience is that especially mothers will blame themselves. There's guilt. Usually there's a crisis on the child or, you know, like uh, one story that is very sad and probably you know people who went through that. You have a young child and you have a swimming pool in the back of your home. You turn, you answer the phone, you turn this way, you come back, your child has drowned in the swimming pool. This is uh, one of the most horrible situations. I, I know people who close to us that it happened to them. Well, the blame, the blame and the guilt that these people will, will keep on for years and years. Or if you or your child will rebel in teenage years, usually the, the wife will say, I haven't been a good mother. If I, I would have done this, if I, I would not, not said this and this. So the, the, the guilt uh, is tremendous uh, on, on women's and on mothers more than on men. Men also have guilt. But women and this family crisis, it's, it's heavier, uh, very guilty for whatever happens into the family. And here she says, have you come here to point out my sins? So she, is guilt, she feels the guilt. She has not received yet the joy, the freedom of uh, justification of being freed by God. And that's why I want to look at the next uh, slide Psalm 32, where David really uh, expressed it. How blessed, this experience of joy, this release from the guilt of our past. How blessed is the one whose disobedience is forgiven, whose sin is covered. How blessed or, or joyful or happy. How blessed is the person, how f the feeling of freedom against whom the Lord does not charge iniquity, and in whose spirit there is no deceit. So obviously this widow had not experienced this sense of freedom because she says, have you come here to remind me of my guilt? My guilt is still on me. I still think about that. I have not been set free of my guilt. So, so God is more interested not only with this widow concerning the famine. He's interested with our salvation and our justification. And look at the end, after the son is given back to her, he has been raised from the dead. Look at verse 24, just up here, click. Then the woman said to Elijah, now by this, now there's a change in her understanding of God and her relationship with the man of God. There's something that has changed, she sees differently. Now by this, I know now, I know now that you are a man of God and that the word of the Lord in your mouth is true. Something has changed. There was a demonstration of God's power deep down in her life. And I know for sure, I know by experience, 
Hallelujah. I knew a, a pastor, I've known a pastor in Inner Mongolia, northeast of China, who went into the most remote part to the, this minority, Mo Mongolian minority, but in, in Inner Mongolia. He says that these people lived in conditions, they were poorer than the poorest of Africa. That's how he said that. They live with nothing. They had nothing. He says, when we preach the word of God to them, you could not preach theology to them because they, 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 they don't know how to read. They don't know anything. They have not been schooling or whatever. So they prayed for their needs. There was a lot of disease. There was a lot of sickness. And many of them had been healed. And they understood God. They understood that theology. They could not understand the, the, the theological words, but they could understand a demonstration of power in God. So I remember that when I was reading that, because she says the same thing here. By this, now I know, I understand that the words of God and your mouth are true. God is alive. God has seen me. God has come to my rescue. God is in control. God sent you to me for a reason. I recognize the working and the plan of God in my life. And that's the purpose of God. That's the purpose of this. Individually and as parents, we need to learn these lessons that the word of the Lord in your mouth is the truth from generation to generation. Think about the Christian doctors. We have doctors here in the room. Think about the benefits of having a Christian doctor who seek the Lord for his patient, who prays, who search the mind of the Lord for the right diagnostics, the, the complicated situation, the right cure, the right medicine. How privileged we have. You have a doctor, and you have a Christian doctor, but you can separate it. The Christian doctor can only exercise doc me medicine without, without being really a Christian doctor. But if you are a Christian doctor, then you will see the power of the Lord manifested into that. Hallelujah. And then you will see also if you are, I, I know a friend of mine, he's a scientist, I shared that before. A researcher was part of a team in university in Ohio searching for the semiconductor. Semiconductor did not exist yet. They were searching for it. And they always failed, they always failed until he prayed specially in despair and God revealed the secret missing ingredient in that experience. And today you can enjoy your mobile phone because this man, simple guy, he came to Lighthouse a few years back again and he was a man who walked in miracles. His granddaughter had a coma, she went into an hospital, she was dying, nothing, the doctor says nothing to do. He prayed for her and she came back to life. I, I listened to so many of his testimonies. He's a walking uh, man of God, and uh, this man. But he trusted in the power of God and he was very in tune with the Holy Spirit. The baptism of the Holy Spirit was very important to this man. Speaking in tongues was very important to this man. Praying and exercising the gifts of the Holy Spirit was very important to him. But because it was very important to him, then a lot of things happen. Because he made it important in his life. And that's what I, I, I'm seeing and, and to this. We have this tremendous privilege to be in contact with the Holy Spirit on a daily basis, on the deeper side of what God can do, the potential of the divine. But we live in the intellect more than we live in the spirit. And I just want to urge all of us today to, to, to think differently about it. Go to the last slides and quickly we will just read some, some of the, the, these scriptures here. We have to, to face the, the ruler of the powers and the unseen world the spirit at work in the hearts of those who refuse to obey God. We cannot overcome that by our intellect. Impossible. Paul says that our weapons are spiritual and effective and powerful. But we need to exercise that. We need to also become like that. We are called to walk by the Spirit, not to grieve the Holy Spirit, not to quench the Spirit. Do not treat prophetic words like something not important and put on the old spiritual armor. So this morning, in closing, I just want to encourage you to rekindle the fire of the Holy Spirit in you. The desire to have a, a, the Spirit power 
more, uh, that you will be aware of that, that you will uh, seek for it, that you will uh, have the mind of the Spirit. Second Timothy 1 6, this is why I remind you to fan into flames the spiritual gift God gave you. Do not neglect the spiritual gift you receive. And Peter says it so beautifully, we will do well to pay attention to the prophetic word as to a lamp shining in a dark place. Wow, it says it all. We walk in a dark place, we walk in the midst of a crisis, we walk in a morally corrupt society. We do well to pay attention and seek and desire the prophetic word as a light, as a lamp shining in a dark place.